On September 30th, 2022, the Los Angeles County Office of Violence Prevention and the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture celebrated the release of Violence, Hope, and Healing in Los Angeles County. This landmark book contains the gripping stories of more than 30 people from diverse backgrounds whose lives and those of their families have been devastated by violence. Nearly three years earlier, the Office of Violence Prevention and the Department of Arts and Culture embarked on this extraordinary project. It was led by Olga Komandoros, artist in residence. I worked with activists that I knew in the community that I was working with between the Community Partnership Council, people of OVP, we came up with a storytelling project that could be a nice baseline for reaching out to survivors of violence and establishing communication. strategist program is rooted in social practice art. What it really means is that artists are understanding that they can use their experience and background, their practice to have a larger impact on their community. I've never heard of any project like this one that says we're going to make an artistic work that allows other people access to the stories of many people who've experienced a public health problem like violence. Art was a way I could express the world non-verbally and things that were too hard to speak and didn't have a narrative art. This project grew out of an effort to figure out how to use the artist in residence effectively, most effectively, to make violence real and emotional and personal, even as we treat it as a social problem. We had data, but what was really missing was how does violence impact individuals in the community? The idea of a storytelling project was really sort of one degree further in the direction of humanizing things by giving very specific voice to the impact of violence on people's lives. I had to figure out how to work with the community-based organizations that were trusted messengers for community members. I think there's an intrinsic distrust of government, especially in some communities and in communities of color because of past harms. And so the outreach and engagement initially was slow. Identifying people who would be willing to tell their stories was slow, but I think through persistence and through our connections in the South LA communities where our trauma prevention initiative is housed, we were able to make some headway. And especially after working with some trusted community members who then made referrals to others who might want to tell their story. The interviews that underlie the book reveal that there's a very direct link between violence and racism. My very first reporting session at the Utunda Price Center in South LA was a great starting point. The members who showed up were very generous in explaining, asking lots of questions on what was going to happen with this. In early 2020, just as Olga was prepared to start interviewing participants, the world changed in a way that no one could have anticipated. To keep the project alive, she and her team had to completely rearrange their plans. Everything had closed down. She wasn't able to go to community centers in person any longer. We had branded, designed everything, had even a different name for this project. And I went to my community centers that I was going to do in-person recording, whole schedule set up. And when COVID hit, all of that flew out. In preparation for the interview process, Olga enrolled in a lecture series available to the public through the Columbia University Oral History Master's Program. My training talked a lot about power dynamics within interviewing and histories that can feel extractive. And I was really conscious about not falling within those dynamics. Olga accommodated the various needs of her interview subjects. 
I needed to hold space for people and be very clear before we were on the camera. Any questions, make sure people feel supported, they have water, they have bathroom break. I did lots of prep ahead of time. So I would do recordings at night and even revisit people if things didn't feel right the first time. I recorded people in their cars too, if they were at work and they needed a private place to speak. I thought that was interesting. People would go into their car to talk to me. Olga recorded virtual interviews with almost 100 individuals. So, um, as you know, this project is called uh, Violence, Hope, and Healing in Los Angeles County. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to share with us a story about how you've navigated violence in your own life. Um, yeah, we'd really be honored to hear about that. If people needed to have a minute, if they were emotional, and they wanted me to turn, you know, to stop recording, I did that. Like. He hit me so hard, like with his head. I only seen that in the movies. Mm -hmm. And I could swear that I felt like my spirit came out of me and was looking down on both of us. You no, know, when you think about abandonment and when you think about just trying to find your way, growing up with insecurities, looking, um, looking for love and acceptance in the wrong places, a lot of that childhood stuff kind of led me towards uh, some of the violence that I experienced. I had an altar in my house and I'd light a candle and I'd breathe between sessions, try to ground myself. You know, I had my water, I had snacks and I'd have to you know, take a walk around the block sometimes and breathe and then I could be as fully present the best way I could. Set aside a week to sit and read the stories Carefully. I read these stories over and over again, and I think the first thing that struck me was, you know, we have this idea of violence and the communities it affects the populations. We look at our data, we look at the communities most impacted, but just, they were so blunt and powerful and honest. How many points along the way could someone have stepped in and found some opportunity to change their course earlier? And in identifying them as a victim of violence, how do we intervene earlier? How do we change policy, practice, and systems so that we can move further upstream when there is a cry for help? or there is an indicator or some red flag that something is going wrong where we can intervene earlier to prevent violence, the trajectory of violence. There is no way that you could walk away from reading the stories that people have shared, either in the book or um, the additional ones, and not uh, want to make change. I hope it makes us think more holistically in terms of causes and in terms also, as I said, of opportunities for intervention. We really do need to listen to community members and to co-create with them solutions. Critical to our work is to listen to the voices of survivors, to understand how we need to move forward and to help develop the solutions to violence. This project really gets at that soul of the work um, that the office does. We're very excited about that. This is the beginning step and that there is more work to be done, but that we take what we learned from each of the individuals who were brave enough to share their stories, where individually and then collectively across the breadth of stories, there were opportunities to intervene earlier, to prevent violence um, and that is how we will use these stories and that is how we will continue to share them out and share them in so that we can really do that work to understand where we need to isolate those you know, policies and practices where we could do a better job, where we could really make a change that might have an impact on an individual's life.